Welcome back to the Frank Talk Radio Dialogues. And we are continuing with Kahiso Media CEO, Mr. Murphy Morobe, as well as Simpiwe Dana, who will be joining us, speaking to us about the various issues around heritage, around culture, as well as identity. Now, before the break, I, Mr. Morobe, was asking you about the 1976, um, as well as when students rejected Afrikaans as a medium of instruction, which you obviously went so far to address. In fact, speak about the fact that you too are very good in Afrikaans right now, in fact, more better in Afrikaans than you were in Zulu. It's quite an interesting one. And I'm actually pose a question to you, Simpiwe. You know, as an artist who performs in Kosa, would you say that there is many opportunities here in South Africa as they are internationally to gain prominence? Um, um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, okay, there, there seems to be, especially in Europe, mm. the same opportunities as, as, as here in SA mm. for gifts. Um, because because Europe is more multicultural, it's more like a, a multicultural pot, you know. Mm. Um, they welcome music from all over the world. Um, but I would still say there there's still like a dominance of, of English. Um, you see it also in the payment packages <laughs> um, when when you sing in English and when you sing uh, in, a, in, a, in an African language. But what do we do then, you know, as, as I believe that there are many South African artists who might be listening to the show right now thinking, fine, the payment package is not so good. But what do we do to ensure that we get to a point where if you're singing in Isikosa, you get the same payment package as you would when you're singing in English? What do we do? Ah, I, I, I think that's, it's a tough one, you know, because it seems like we really love our English um, everywhere. Um, in essay, so it's 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 really a tough one. Um, it might be a lost battle. Um, um, yeah, that's 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 how I feel. Um, Mr. Morobe, what is your take on Dr. Blade Zimade's proposal um, of speaking, reading, and writing in Indigenous African languages? Should it be considered, you know, as a prerequisite for tertiary education uh, qualifications? Look, I mean, I, I think I think the the 1994 has a value proposition for us as South Africans. Mm. One of which is the restoration of the dignity of our people, of ourselves, of every mm. South African. Mm. And one of the ways in which that's done is by the recognition of the right for people to speak in their own languages. But having said that, as a policy position, you know, it's a good statement. I think it must be supported. It is important for us to make everybody feel that they have a right to be South Africans, to be protected by this constitution. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there has to be a dose of reality about life as we have it today. Because that it means that as South Africans, we have to transact across cultural, racial, and language barriers. We have to consistently find a mechanism that would enable us to effect those transactions. Now, there are a number of ways in which that is done, that, that can be done. In fact, one of which is for government to invest in sponsoring and supporting the proliferation of more languages, or in fact, the proliferation of our languages mm -hmm. in terms of encouraging writing in indigenous languages uh, the scholarships must be targeted. In fact, how you direct your funding from the fiscus, insofar as that policy objective is concerned, where you can incentivize the environment. Because if the incentives are pointed in the right direction, I'm almost I'm certain that, in fact, people will respond to those incentives. But if you make a statement and you put funds into the public kitty, there is no rhyme or rhythm to the way in which those funds are spent, you'll never attain those objectives. So. Your, in terms of public spending at local government and national government level, mm. the conditional grant mechanism in expenditure has to be, in fact, considered as an important tool that government needs to actually improve its ability to utilize them. Because in many countries in the world, when they have an objective, in fact, now we've just had the Olympics. Yes. We've just had the Olympics. If you looked at the performance of the British athletes, you can go back to a decision they've taken years ago that at these Olympics, 
British athletes are going to perform to a particular standard. And they directed funding in a concerted way into programs. They took the lottery funds and they directed them there. You can see what the output of that is. So it can be done, what Dr. Nzimande actually calls for. But at the same time, it's not a, if, if you throw it there into the system, you'll co cause confusion without giving clear direction because it's fine to make a statement. It's a different matter to follow up with actual steps, targets, put money and resources, put the incentives right in universities. Then you'll have the writers coming up and then you'll have the publishers come into the party as well. Now we are taking your calls on your comments as well as questions on heritage, culture and identity as a young person. Give us a ring. Or double one double seven two oh nine nine two. Mr. Marabu, I'm actually going to ask you this question. When we look at South Africa and how we are aiming to be part of a global community, how do we move with the times, especially as young people, you know, and fit into that global community yet remaining true to our culture, to our heritage as well as to our national identities? In 1972, when I joined the South African student movement after it was formed, we then said, what is it that we can do as young people that could actually give us access to more young people to come in? Mm. We then formed cultural groups. You know, we had a group called Kindlemoga, which meant Arise. There was Mifloti and other groups. And in those groups, we had poetry reading, we had music, we had actually place that were actually politically conscious place that we use to, con as we said, to conscientize the people. Now, those activities are important for young people. It's about getting involved in your local areas. You don't have even to aim for the stars. Look in your own area. There's material that can be used. Be active in your, in your schools, mm -hmm. in your youth organizations. I, I work with young people now in an organization called City. One of the, the mantras in that organization says to young people, we, we call for discipline, we call for spirit, and we call for purpose. So when they meet every morning, they chant that to themselves to say, spirit, discipline, and purpose. Now those elements, they are derived based on our experience of where young people are. Because if you don't have a fostering of that element of spirit, because spirit is about your own sense of being, the way you feel, your, your ethos, your mindset. It actually enables you to be able to engage with anything that you meet, let alone the universe. Because once you have those three, I can tell you now, the world is your oyster. Cynthia, you've been very um, robust in terms of your opinion <laughs> and your take, especially when it comes to heritage and culture, as well as the Biko legacy. But for those who do not know, the Biko legacy, what does it mean to you? Um, for me, Bigo is the one leader who makes sense in, in what he said and in his philosophy, what he stood for. Um, he was, his, his, his approach was more than just about the physical um, emancipation of, of black people. He also very much focused on, on, the, on, the, on the psychological aspect of it, which um, for me, I don't believe that um, even when you have got the most money, if you are not psychologically, spiritually emancipated, um, there's a reason why we have so many corrupt um, leaders and people that do actually not care about the progress of black people in general. Who, go, who get into offices and rather empower themselves um, instead of empowering the whole nation. And I believe that this psychological trauma that we have not even begun to start to deal with could be part of the reason why. I cannot believe that after centuries of oppression, oppression people would come out psychologically sound. And that is why I put so much respect for, for, for Steve Beagle because he believed that that would be the first step in freeing black people. And it is quite problematic that we have never had that, um, set, uh, what do you call it, like a, a session with a shrink 
Therapy. Yes. Yes. We need therapy in the, in the country, first and foremost, before we can even get to running the country. Mm. That is why I've got so much respect for him. I believe that we've got a question from our audience. Please state your name and your surname, and then go ahead with the question. Uh, my name is Kalibai. I have a um, comment and a question, in, in, in a sense. Uh, Paul, uh, something that's happened is that everybody, I think, believes by now that, you know, Steve Biggers' book was actually quite a great read. And if you need to direct the way we think, um, you know, there's quotes about, you know, the greatest uh, weapon in the hands of the oppressor is in the hands of the oppressed. You know, later on. Okay. Sorry. But a lot of these words and all of these phrases that come out of that book are in English, and they have been difficult, and the book is actually quite really difficult to read in English. And I think some of his thoughts, because firstly it was bright, but also because we're in English, have not been able to be translated in a way that people could understand them so that they could be useful for them. You know, so that it was difficult. And if you notice, for example, without making any statements about religion itself, where it is, for example, the Bible is translated into almost every language, so that actually everybody now understands what the message in the Bible is, you know, in terms of um, who Jesus is and everything that it teaches. But we haven't been able to receive the teachings of um, black intellectuals, so to speak, or black leaders, because in, in a lot of them are in English or in other uh, European languages or even Afrikaans. And is it therefore un is it impossible to be able to translate these into languages that young people can understand? Because they go to church and they read the Bible in in Koso and in Setswana mm. and they understand it. Is it possible to translate some of these thoughts into into um, languages that can then um, reach uh, South Africans for consciousness and for nothing else? Mr. Moraga, I think that's the point I was making earlier on about what from a from government perspective, what government can do, you know, to influence publishing in the direction that you're suggesting. If, if, you, if you think about it, the, the, the missionaries were really focus group. They, had, they believed in something, they knew what they wanted, and they put resources and money behind it. And they had explorers who went into jungles carrying the Bible. You know, they, they sponsored them, they supported them. Right now, they crisscrossed the entire globe. Now, that's just one way in which you, you, you attain your objective because, as I said, there are resources available. You know, there are people who write things every day. Now, if we say our policy is to encourage the proliferation of the rest of the language groups other than English in the literary sphere, the resources must then be directed in a way that they incentivize authors, they promote writing, the universities, you know, have to actually come to the party. Because I can tell you now, 10 years into the democracy of this country, the universities that we're talking about that actually have to produce these intellectuals had not even had a convocation among themselves to say, the paradigm has changed, what is our new brief as institutions that must produce the next range of, intellect of intellectuals capital. They are playing catch up now, you know, but even as they do so, they get caught in what Tessin Pugh was referring to. They've got their own issues of corruption and personalities. They come to play and suddenly the universities become an arena where personal agendas begin to proliferate <clears throat> rather than the core objectives for why these institutions are there in the first place. So in a way, I think we have the resources in this country. It's about getting our government and our public offices to put the right programs of incentives to create the opportunities.